Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and hello to you online. I don't see any of you, but I see your boxes with your names. Um, so thank you for the introduction. It's been such a phenomenal day and the work that's happening here is absolutely incredible. I had such an exciting day of conversations. The work you're doing is incredible. So my background is actually in human population genetics. I can barely even say that anymore because that was almost 20 years ago. But working on humans was um, challenging in numerous ways. And I got really interested in understanding the genomic basis of adaptation to extreme environments. And my work has always been motivated by this question of how do organisms live in the different environments that they encounter? And so here I've just picked a smattering of environments that I think are really beautiful and interesting. And you can think about the different organisms that live there and how they got to be there and what they're doing there. And the way that I think about genetic variation and how organisms evolve is in the context of their environment, thinking about bridging from genotype to phenotype by looking at the integration of these different responses, ultimately linking genetic variation to fitness. And so we can think about all of the hierarchical levels going, as I said, from genetic variation to gene expression, maybe to protein abundance, biochemical function, physiological function, organismal performance in some kind of environment or multiple environments, and then ultimately fitness and how one might measure that. Of course, we draw this beautiful linear progression across these hierarchical scales, but in reality, this is nonlinear, right? The, there are nonlinear connections between genetic variation to biochemical function, from genetic variation to abundance and et cetera. And so we really need to think about integrating from genetic variation to fitness across these levels in different ways. The questions that drive my research, sorry, it feels funny, um, is what is the genomic architecture of novel traits? Are there common genomic changes underlying parallel phenotypic changes? And I know multiple of you are interested in this very question. We had some really fun discussions about this today already, and I look forward to more discussions about this question. And then ultimately, how predictable is the evolutionary process? So if we know the answer to some of these questions, can we predict how organisms may respond to a novel environment, to a shifting environment, et cetera? And so these are the questions that have driven my research from the beginning. And I use extreme environments as a framework to study evolutionary processes and to answer these questions. And the reason that I shifted from human population genetics to organisms in these wild extreme environments is that uh, extreme environments are often replicated, right? You think about your favorite extreme environment, and there are probably multiple instances of that favorite extreme environment. The other thing that was particularly appealing to me was that there are strong and constant selective pressures. So we can make predictions about how an organism and its genome may change in response to that extreme environment where the selective pressure is known and then test those predictions. Right? We can make hypotheses and test those predictions. We often see convergent phenotypes in extreme environments, especially in very disparate uh, clades. And sometimes, although not always, we have an opportunity to study closely related organisms that are not in that extreme environment. You know, and in the case in your lab where you're working on heat temperature, you actually have set up really nice experimental designs where you're exactly testing those non-adapted and adapted populations. The populations I'm working on are wild populations, so we don't have quite the beautiful setup, but I hope that you'll see some of the interesting parallels to the work that's happening in the experimental evolution here. So the two stories that I want to tell you about today are adaptation to polar environments and parallel adaptation to hydrogen sulfide. I also work on bears. I'm not going to talk about the bears today, unfortunately, but they're also adapted to cold temperatures. So I'm going to start by talking about briefly about adaptation to polar environments, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about adaptation to hydrogen sulfide. And as you can tell from the pictures, this is going to be with fish as, this, as the organisms living in these environments. So antifreeze proteins are particularly interesting because they allow organisms to live in sub-freezing temperatures. So here's a cartoon of what's happening. So on the left, you'll see that 
in the ocean, the melting point and freezing point is the same. It's just below freezing because we have the solutes in the ocean. And without, without antifreeze proteins, you see that after that point at which we have a, uh, a, an unhappy fish, quite frozen. So in the presence of antifreeze proteins, that's what AFP stands for, is that fish can survive in much colder temperatures. So here we have the melting point stays the same. And the freezing point is now decreased by more than, my, that more than one degree C. So it's, the freezing point is about almost minus two C. Now beyond that temperature, the fish will start accumulating ice crystals. But this difference between the melting point and freezing point is how it's called thermal hysteresis. And it's how antifreeze proteins were initially discovered by that difference in freezing point and melting point. The mechanism is quite interesting. Here's a cartoon of that. Um, on the right, where you see that these balls represent the antifreeze proteins themselves, and they interact with the leading edge of an ice crystal. And this leads to the curvature of that ice crystal, which then depresses the freezing point. Now, of course, as the temperature continues to decrease, these become accumulated into the ice crystal, and then you have ice crystal formation after that temperature. There have been multiple independent origins of antifreeze proteins in polar fishes. And here I like to show this, and I'm, I'm only gonna talk about one of the types really, but I like to show this because it shows that they have very different structures. So these are really convergent to the same function, but have independent origins. So here you can see the, they're just characterized either as type one, two, or three. And there are also these antifreeze glycoproteins, which are characterized by an alanine, alanine, threonine repeat. They have different origins in the genomes and different groups have worked on identifying what the origin in the genome is for these antifreeze proteins. And here you can see the genes or the unknown region that has led to that different type of antifreeze protein. And actually, for example, in the uh, glycoproteins in the Antarctic and Arctic, there are two different independent origins, one, in, one at each pole. There are some similarities though among these, and the two similarities that you'll find in antifreeze proteins are high copy number in the genome and diversity among copies. So to really understand how antifreeze proteins have evolved, especially across a global scale, I've focused on type three antifreeze proteins in eel pouts. And partially because these fish are just incredibly pouty and quite adorable, um, but the reason that I really chose this clade is that the fish are globally distributed. So we have species and genera in the, in, totally across the globe. They're bottom dwelling and they're very abundant in Arctic and Antarctic oceans, but you can also find them in essentially any other ocean, right? This is data from OBIS for the infra order. And this shows you really, they're everywhere. And they're well known for the evolution of type three antifreeze proteins. So the motivating hypothesis for this work was that copy number of the antifreeze protein would vary with latitude, with more copies, the closer you get to each pole, and that antifreeze protein diversity among copies functions to enhance freezing point depression. So the first thing that we did to get at this was a phylogeographic study to understand what the global distribution of the ZOARKD is and how this might relate to copy number and the evolution of antifreeze proteins. So at the very top, I'll just point out no antifreeze proteins, that's stickleback up there. And this is the entire clade that I'm talking about. And I've put some key points in time here, Southern Ocean cooling, Arctic Ocean cooling, just so you can see. And what I want to point out specifically is that there in the Zoar, Zoar Katie, there are fish that are found in the Arctic in pink, in the North temperate in that purple color, orange in the tropics, the south temperate, and the Antarctic. And so actually in this family alone, we have representations across the globe. Okay. So with that, we then wanted to sample some of the species in this, in this group and look at copy number variation. So here are the distributions of some of the species that we could get our hands on. And a lot of this was driven by opportunistic sampling from museums. So I really want to, you know, plug the importance of museums and collections because as much as I would love to go on cruises in the Arctic and Antarctic and anywhere else, 
other people have done this. And so I could use their samples and sequence genomes from the samples that were collected appropriately. And so here are the distributions based on fish base for some of the samples that we could get our hands on. Just to point out, this is the clade that I'm interested in. This folus is, a, is an outgroup for that, but it is in the same larger group. So we expect it to have antifreeze proteins and it does have quite an Arctic distribution. So here's the equator. And we can then do some genome sequencing. This was largely with short read genomes. So we use short read genome data to then count the approximate number of copies of the antifreeze protein gene in the genome, okay? And so here I've just put some of those data on the right and you can see that there's quite a bit of variation. And this is, this is just sorted by phylogeny, right? Just by phylogenetic relationships. But we can change the ordering and change the ordering to be based on distribution. And this is what it looks like when you order based on distribution. And hopefully you can see this very interesting pattern of antifreeze protein copy number that increases the closer the distribution gets to either of the poles. Now we haven't, this is very much a work in progress and I will admit that in the last couple of days, I've looked at another Antarctic genome and found it only has one copy of antifreeze proteins. So it completely violates this beautiful hypothesis that we made. That's like not even, it's not even hot off the presses because it's not in the press. This is literally yesterday's finding where I was like, ah, okay, we need to rethink this a little bit. But what's interesting about that species, which I haven't plotted here for you, is it's actually, um, closely related to this melanostigma clade. So it's giving us lots to, lots to think about. But what I will point out is that the, the association that we see here is not explained by phylogenetic inertia. We don't see that the copy number is correlated based on phylogenetic relatedness. And so there does seem to be something happening with overwintering temperature, temperature generally. And so we're trying to think to be a little bit more um, purposeful in our definition of this species distribution and where they are, because right now we've just picked latitude as the uh, characterization. But of course, we know that these species are going to be in different environments where maybe there is more ice overwinter or not, depending on where in the Hudson Bay they are, for example. So we're, this is very much work in progress. The genomic data from these is really fun to look at. So for some of them, we actually have long read genome data. And that genomic data allows us to investigate other regions of the genome. So this is just one other region of the genome. It's hemoglobin clusters and some of the species that are the in the clade that I was talking about are here. These are ones that have long read or mostly long read genome assemblies. And this allows us to look at the reduction in hemoglobin copy number in our Arctic and Antarctic species, which has been shown before in, in notothenioids, which is another Antarctic clade that actually has some lineages that have the complete loss of hemoglobin and they have the white blood because they've lost hemoglobin. Really kind of fascinating. We don't see the complete loss here, but we do see a reduction in copy, significant reduction in copy number of that. So let's go back to the antifreeze protein cluster for a minute. So we've done this long read se genome sequencing We've now assembled several other genomes, as I just mentioned, which didn't even make it into this slide because it was yesterday and I figured I wanted to spend last night exploring Vienna at night and not putting more slides into a talk. So my apologies for that, but I did get some great pictures of the church at night. Um, so when we look at the specific region around the antifreeze proteins, the first thing I want to point out is that there's a single origin. Right? How do we know that? Well, if we look at the flanking genes around this tandem array, it's the same across all of the species. So this allows us to, you know, by parsimony, infer that there's a single origin. Of course, this is stickleback. They don't have antifreeze proteins. But somewhere back here, there is the origin of the antifreeze proteins. And in some of these species, that, that array has increased in copy number. Now, you may be wondering, why are there some boxes above and below the, the line. And that indicates directionality of transcription of the genes. And I put that in there to remind myself somewhat to say that these are not simple tandem arrays where the gene just gets another copy and another copy in the same direction, right? They're inverted, they're 
doing all sorts of different things. And we're currently exploring the evolution of these tandem arrays. And we've found that there are actually transposable elements that are on either side of each of these copies. And we're currently exploring, so each of those, for example, we're currently exploring the, the role of the transposable elements in the generation of these copies. Another thing that I mentioned, and this is just a cartoon of it, is that there's variation among the copies within a genome and across genomes. And we are now, this is just a cartoon of it, so don't take these colors too seriously, but we're exploring how that variation will allow us to understand the evolution of this family by looking at similarity and making trees of relationships of these genes. And ultimately the goal, which we started, but haven't finished and is, is happening right now in my lab, is to test whether or not these different isoforms affect freezing point depression in different ways. And we're trying to do that with concentrations of antifreeze proteins that mimic what we see in the actual fish themselves. So we are expressing each antifreeze protein in E. coli, extracting it, and then measuring freezing point depression on a slide, essentially. So you can do this with a, with a uh, microscope and a drop of oil with our solutes and our antifreeze protein isoforms in it and decrease the temperature to measure, to look at differences in freezing point and also ice crystal formation. So this is ongoing in the lab. So type three antifreeze proteins are under positive selection. I didn't show this, but there's a lot of selective pressure for variation between those copy and specifically uh, mutations that change the encoded amino acid. We see that antifreeze proteins evolved before the cooling of the Southern Ocean and before the rise of the eel pouts that are the globally distributed family. There is a single, mod a single origin of the antifreeze protein. I showed you that from our long read data where it's inserted in exactly the same place in the genome. And one of the, the newest genomes that we got actually shows that there's just one clade that has a second insertion. And now I'm trying to figure out if that insertion originated from the progenitor gene or from the antifreeze protein array that was already there. And copy number is correlated with latitude, and I should put a little asterisk there that says like, but still looking into it. All right, and you know, we're currently working on those genotype to phenotype functional assays. So I wanted to give you kind of a flavor for some of the things that we're thinking about in my lab. And so in the context of genome evolution in polar environments, we're also looking at genomes, and, and this actually should be now a much bigger um, tree because so many genomes have been sequenced in the last year that are really high quality long read genomes from polar and non-polar environments. And so we are now taking a bigger look at what's happening in the genomes, especially of organisms that are living in these very cold environments. And is there something about the genome architecture in these different species, despite the fact that they have evolved different types of antifreeze proteins, is there something about their genome architecture, transposable element content, et cetera, that facilitates their ability to adapt to freezing temperatures? and other things that may go along with polar environments such as high dissolved oxygen and extreme daylight length variation depending on if they're deep sea or not. So that's, that's kind of one arm of the lab. So I'll, I'll leave you with that to think about genomes in polar environments. And I wanna switch gears for the rest of today to talk about parallel adaptation to hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is absolutely fascinating in the aquatic environments that we're studying it in, it's a very strong and very constant selective pressure. The levels which have been measured over time by my colleagues do not change over time. It's naturally occurring because of distant volcanic activity and hydrogen sulfide is acutely toxic in micromolar concentrations. It inhibits oxygen transport and cellular respiration and in aquatic environment, it causes and aggravates hypoxia. So there's a kind of a second level of uh, extremeness, if you will, in that where oxygen levels are also decreased in the hydrogen sulfide rich environments. There are also some really interesting biomedical implications and applications, which I'm not gonna get into because 
for today. We're all about adaptation. So hydrogen sulfide is found in springs in the Caribbean basin. And actually, tomorrow, I have a graduate student who's traveling with the field crew to go to southern Mexico to, there it is, to continue some of our sampling and research there. So these are the springs that the fish are found in. But what's more important is that there have been multiple different species from the same family that have invaded hydrogen sulfide rich springs across these different springs. And here are just some of them. This is not all of them. It's a super exciting system. And when I learned about this system, as I was thinking about what I wanted to move to away, as I was moving away from human genetics, I learned of this system from my colleague, Mihi Tobler, and was like, this is incredible. It's a natural experiment. We have natural replicates. And I'll, I'll zoom in for a minute to show you many of the natural replicates. But in addition to having replicates at the population level, which I'll spend most of the time talking about, we also have replication at the species level in this much broader context. Now, some limitations are that these are live bearing fishes and that they're, they can be quite hard to rear. And so that, that is a limitation because I've always wanted to do different exposures at early life stages and other things, but they're live bearing. So that does limit some of the questions that we can ask and answer about the effects of hydrogen sulfide. But that notwithstanding, here I want to take you on a trip to southern Mexico. It's very warm there right now. It's about, oh gosh, in C, I don't know what it's about, 38 C. So I think that's, that's pretty warm. Um, and here we are, and water is going into the Gulf of Mexico, and there are multiple springs that have Facilia mexicana inhabitants, and there are pairs of sulfitic and non-sulfitic springs. So this is our population level natural experiment. Now the environments themselves are quite small. So this is a picture from Google Earth that shows the entirety of the distribution of one of the populations. And it's right here in the middle. It's a little bit hard to see here, but hopefully you can see that this spring looks different from the rest. It's kind of milky colored and it's about the size of a football field. And that my colleague actually and his student rediscovered this spring using Google Earth and looking for this characteristic milky color that was that is characteristic of the hydrogen, the sulfide starting to precipitate out of the springs. And they were found it and we've sampled now from that spring. So these populations, despite having this very limited habitat in terms of size, the population sizes themselves are quite large and the populations are locally adapted. So these are the results of a reciprocal transplant experiment that my colleague performed, where they sampled fish from each of the locations, hiked them around to put them in the other spring type, and then measured mean survival after 24 hours. Okay, so keep that in mind when looking at this. So here we have the experimental habitat at the very bottom, either non-sulfitic or sulfitic, and habitat of origin, here, non-sulfitic non or sulfitic, non-sulfitic or sulfitic. And so first you see that non-sulfitic individuals in non-sulfitic habitat have a very high mean survival. Whereas sulfitic individuals in a non-sulfitic habitat do, there is some cost, their survival is lower, not super low. Now, if you're a non-sulfitic ecotype in sulfitic water, survival is quite low. And if you are sulfitic in a sulfitic habitat, your survival is is pretty good. All right, there are really important respiratory adaptations as well. So as I said, hydrogen sulfide causes and aggravates hypoxia. And these fish need oxygen to detoxify the effects of hydrogen sulfide. And so there's a double need here where oxygen is needed for detoxification. And so the, the fish perform aquatic surface respiration where they spend a lot of time right at the surface layer of the water air interface, getting the highly oxygenated water that's just at that top layer. And this has led, presumably this and then the need for more oxygen has led to the convergent evolution of large heads and gills in all of the sulfitic springs that the sulfitic fish are, all the sulfitic fish in the springs that they're found in. So here is a geomorphometrics of the non-sulfitic and sulfitic fish, and you can kind of squint and see differences. But when that's quantified into gill filament length or other measures of their head size, you can see that in terms of gill filament length, 
there are significant differences in each of the drainages between the non-sulfitic and sulfitic populations. Moreover, really related to survival is that uh, survival in hydrogen sulfide varies between or among ecotypes, right? So here, these two plots go together on the left, where on the x-axis of both is time, and on the y-axis is the concentration of hydrogen sulfide, which is increasing over time, and the bottom plot goes with this, looking at cumulative survival. And keep in mind, this is seconds, right? And so after about 600 seconds, the non-sulfitic fish start to lose equilibrium and survival decreases. Whereas the sulfitic fish can survive for longer in hydrogen sulfide, but there is a, a limit to that survival. And at some point they become overwhelmed and start to lose equilibrium. So the great thing about hydrogen sulfide and the reason that I was so excited about this as a system and a very extreme environment is that hydrogen sulfide is a known physiochemical stressor. So here is the electron transport chain, right? Oxidative phosphorylation, we have our different components, and we know what happens, and here's, right, here's mitochondria. So we know what happens when hydrogen sulfide comes in. Hydrogen sulfide can come into the cell. We, we have this mechanism as well for hydrogen sulfide detoxification. And we have it because hydrogen sulfide is a byproduct of cysteine catabolism. And so we're all generating very low levels of hydrogen sulfide, and we have all the machinery to detoxify that. So hydrogen sulfide comes in and it's detoxified by the sulfur quinine oxidoreductase pathway into benign compounds. And we'll just say that's the SQR pathway. All right, well, when you have a lot of hydrogen sulfide coming in, it actually blocks the effects of um, cytochrome C oxidase and now you get blocking of the respiratory chain, right? And now there's a problem. And you can see this is exactly where the effects are. So this allows us knowing this about the effects of hydrogen sulfide lets us actually make predictions about where in the genome we should see the effects of selection by hydrogen sulfide on it. So we expected to see, these are our predictions before the study I'm gonna tell you about. We expected to see modification of cytochrome C oxidase, which is the major target of toxicity, right? So one way to adapt to hydrogen sulfide is no longer have it be toxic to you. We expected to see the upregulation of enzymes that detoxify hydrogen sulfide, Right, if you have more of a toxin coming in, it's probably good to ramp up getting it out. Um, we expected to see a down regulation of enzymes producing hydrogen sulfide within the body. If you don't need it, if it's coming externally, maybe you don't need to generate it endogenously anymore. And there are a bunch of other molecular targets. So I'm showing you, you know, one part, but there's a lot more that's known about hydrogen sulfide and we're taking a genome scale view, but I'm purposefully just zooming it in onto one specific piece, but imagine there are lots of other mole potential molecular targets of hydrogen sulfide. So we went out into the field and collected individuals from the wild. This was quite a few years ago now, and I wish I had my field pictures in here still because at one point in time, I, I did go into the field very briefly, but 95% of my time is spent at the computer and always has been, but you know, I, I have labeled tubes in the field once or twice. So we went out into the field, sampled non-sulfitic and sulfitic individuals, and I, we just sampled six individuals from each location and sequenced RNA from the gills. And this was actually ten, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and we asked what genes are differentially expressed between sulfitic and non-sulfitic populations and shared among all three of them. Because we thought anything that might be unique to one of those populations might tell us about subtleties of that environment. And we're trying to leverage these multiple natural experiments. And so we said, okay, we're gonna take each one and then look at the intersection because that's gonna tell us what's shared and hopefully really relevant to hydrogen sulfide. So when we look at which genes are differentially expressed and shared, differentially expressed between sulfitic and non-sulfitic in each comparison and shared, we see several interesting things. And I've colored them in red here for the upregulated in all sulfitic populations. So one of which is that we saw no evidence for downregulation of genes involved in endogenous hydrogen sulfide production. So it was like cysteine catabolism is going to happen no matter what. So there is going to be the endogenous hydrogen sulfide production happening regardless, which is, I guess, how we rationalized it after the fact. We even see upregulation of one of those genes. We saw upregulation of genes related to detoxification. Uh, consistent upregulation of some of the genes involved in complex three and cytochrome C, 
And so this then, this was all in the wild. And I had some interesting conversations with some of you about these kind of questions as well. This is in the wild. So is this plastic or is this evolved? And this is important when we're talking about adaptive differences in adaptation, adaptation to hydrogen sulfide. And so this, of course, begged that question, are these gene expression differences that we're seeing from field caught individuals, the result of evolved changes in gene expression, or merely we're capturing some really interesting plastic responses to living in hydrogen sulfide. So we took the fish into the lab, and this was done in my collaborator, Mihi Tobler's lab, and set up a common garden rearing experiment for two of the Pacilia Mexicana populations. We, didn't, we weren't able to do all three because one of them is quite hard to rear in the lab. So we have two of the populations and we had both the sulfitic and non-sulfitic ecotypes from two of those drainages. And then we exposed fish to sublethal levels of hydrogen sulfide and used this to determine the role of phenotypic plasticity versus heritable differences in gene, gene expression. And without getting too much in the weeds, what we saw is that there was evidence for evolved changes in gene expression in many of the candidate genes. Now, keep in mind, I'm only showing you this, this picture of the um, oxidative phosphorylation, but you can think that you know, we have the rest of the genome as well, and we ask these same questions of the rest of the genome. And here you see, I've just highlighted some of the genes that have evolved, evidence of evolved changes in gene expression. And these changes might have been constitutive changes in gene expression or changes in plasticity. So I haven't categorized that here, but we see that there are evolved changes in gene expression. And we can intersect that with the genes that had evidence for upregulation in our wild population. And in this bright purple, the brightest purple here uh, in the middle, we see that these are genes that had evidence of upregulation as well as evidence for evolved changes in gene expression. And what I wanna just highlight is that many of the genes that are kind of key in this pathway showed both evidence in the field as well as evidence for evolved changes in gene expression. So what we're currently working on is looking at what are the mechanisms underlying those changes in gene expression. And so we're taking three different approaches actively in the lab, looking at nascent tra transcription through cap short RNA sequencing, looking at microRNAs, and looking at methylation, and trying to disentangle what are the roles of these different regulatory mechanisms, specifically microRNAs and methylation, and can looking at nascent RNAs, RNAs that are being actively transcribed, help us identify potential enhancer regions and promoter regions that are leading to these differences in gene expression between the different populations. So to tell you just a little bit about what we've found with the nascent RNA sequencing, because this is a, a unpublished ongoing project, which we're really excited about. So we're sequencing nascent RNAs through doing what's called short capped RNA sequencing. And this allows us to capture mRNAs, enhanced RNAs, PRI, micro, pre, micro RNAs, and other such things. And what happens is that we're capturing just the first 20 to 30 base pairs of a transcript by capturing the five prime methyl cap. And so this allows us to, in addition to identifying the exact transcription start site, we can actually also identify enhancers that are actually bi-directionally transcribed very, very small pieces of the genome. And we can look at how the genomic location of some of these nascent RNAs correlates to gene expression of nearby genes. So I wanna walk you through this, this plot a little bit. So here on the left, we have the genomic location of our nascent transcripts and everything that we've done, and I wish I had said this before, is in the gill. And we've picked the gill because we think that's the primary site of detoxification and toxicity targets, because that's where you know, they're fish, they're living in the water. And so those gills are constantly being flushed with hydrogen sulfide. So everything that we've done is in the gills. So here are the locations in the genome of these nascent transcripts that are, that are being expressed in the gill. We can then ask, what is the, what's the closest gene that is nearby and is it differentially expressed or not? And so here, these are, we're just kind of mapping. Okay, so there are a bunch of uh, nascent transcripts who are nearby differentially expressed genes. There are also some that are 
not differentially expressed, and then there's potentially no match. I mean, there's nothing nearby that's been annotated in our study. And then of the differentially expressed genes, we can ask which genes are upregulated in the same direction as the nascent transcripts, or the, as transcription of the nascent RNA and the, the mRNA in the same direction, or is it in opposite direction? And is it up or down? And so here you see that for most of the transcripts, the nascent RNA confirms the directionality of its closest neighbor, of its closest gene that's differentially expressed. And in a few cases, we do have divergent gene expression. Okay? And you can see that this is kind of regardless of, of which category in the gene there are. So we can take these differentially expressed genes and specifically the ones that are up and down regulated and ask whether or not there are transcription factors that are overrepresented in the promoters of each of those categories. And indeed, here's a plot showing kind of those results. And it's, it's a little bit kind of funny to see, but we can see that less common uh, transcription factors over here and more common transcription factors are to the right. And we have either overrepresented or underrepresented. We have this overrepresentation. And many of those transcription factors have already been identified or have some annotation associated them with hydrogen sulfide from other organisms. So this now has allowed us to start thinking about what are the key transcription factors that are playing a role in this response or evolution to hydrogen sulfide rich springs. We're asking similar questions of microRNAs, and here on the left is our microRNA, or sorry, gene expression variation, and the middle is microRNA expression variation, and the circles are females, and these are not the same individuals, unfortunately, and you see that we have both males and females in our microRNA study, but we can associate microRNA expression levels with mRNA expression levels by identifying the targets of those microRNAs, so we can identify which microRNAs are differentially expressed. And then of those microRNAs that are differentially expressed, what are their putative targets? And so here are two of them that are quite interesting. So this is one of our identified microRNAs on the left, and its target is SQR, the sulfur quinine octoreductase. And you see that as the, the microRNA level is low, hydrogen, the uh, SQR mRNA expression levels are high. All right. So I've told you a fair bit about kind of the first two levels of this uh, connecting, or mostly actually gene expression. I've told you a little bit about gene expression in the context of the environment. And so I wanna take you a little bit farther down thinking about biochemical function because hydrogen sulfide is such an important toxicant and a lot is known about it. This allowed us to ask additional questions. So we see reduced sensitivity to hydrogen sulfide in some of the populations. Well, what does that mean? I have colleagues who measured the effects of hydrogen sulfide concentration here on the x-axis with relative cytochrome C oxidase activity on the y-axis. And each of the lines is colored by whether or not it's a sulfitic or non-sulfitic population. And we did some additional analyses to show that some of those uh, sequences of the mitochondria have convergently evolved amino acid changes, while another one didn't. And you see that two of, actually three of our sulfitic populations here show no changes in cytochrome C oxidase activity as hydrogen sulfide increases. But hopefully you also see there's one population that lives in hydrogen sulfide, right? It's yellow, but there is no evidence for selection on this locus and they're sensitive to cytochrome C oxidase. So this was a really interesting finding for us because those fish are living in hydrogen sulfide and yet have a sensitive cytochrome C oxidase. So there must be something else happening there. And so, you know, as I said, these um, populations, some but not all, are resistant to hydrogen sulfide, at least in terms of their cytochrome C oxidase. So what about the enzyme that's responsible for detoxification? So that's SQR. So we measured Cytochrome C oxidase, sorry, we measured relative SQR activity. And again, this is a spike in experiment with hydrogen sulfide concentration on the x-axis and SQR activity on the y-axis. And what you'll see is that as the hydrogen sulfide increases, you see increases in relative SQR activity for the sulfitic lineages and decreases for the non-sulfitic lineages. And then you have one sulfitic lineage that starts to decrease. And of course, that's the lineage that has the cytochrome the sensitive cytochrome C oxidase, right? Of course. Now, you're probably thinking like, what's going on there? And unfortunately, unlike an experimental evolution experiment where you can control many of the variables, 
here, that population actually lives in water that's slightly less sulfitic than the other two. And so there are like one additional variable there, which is that maybe they just don't need quite as much resistance because the levels of hydrogen sulfide that they are seeing are just not quite as high. Um, this is kind of interesting. So coming from it, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a genome scientist by training. And so I want to say, I wanted to know whether or not these uh, differences in toxic, toxicity, sensitivity, et cetera, in SQR and cytochrome C oxidase were because of a shared origin or independent origins, right? Like, is it different or the same? Has it convergently evolved? This is what I really want to know. So on the left here is the population tree. The topology of 76% of the genome looks like this. Here are the yellow lineages, all the, are the sulfitic lineages. We had at this point in time sampled another. We've rediscovered this additional sulfitic lineage. So we added that into this study. And on the right, I'm going to show you the tree of the genome. What's the, the, what's, the, what's the best fit tree for the genome right around the SQR locus? And there it is. And the topology, this topology fits 0.36% of the genome. And you can tell me right away, right? There is a single origin for SQR for all of our sulfidic lineages. And if we look at the identity of genes in that 0.36% of the genome, it's enriched for genes that have any kind of sulfide annotation, any, any GO annotation related to sulfide. And so it seems like there is a single shared origin in these populations for the increased detoxification. And what we're thinking is happening here is that we get low levels of migration from the sulfitic, one of the sulfitic adapted populations into the non-sulfitic population, and then the shuffling and movement of significant adaptive alleles into the other sulfitic populations. And so here is, a, is an admixture plot where every column is an individual, and I wish I'd labeled as these on the left, not surprisingly, are our non-sulfitic individuals, and here on the right are individuals that were sampled in the sulfitic environment. And this clustering algorithm, we, we assigned a K of two and said, okay, please assign each individual the proportion of ancestry that best matches for that individual from, from a possibility of two populations. And what you'll see is we interestingly captured an F1 in the sulfitic environment, which we did not expect, because you can see there's, we, I showed you at the very beginning, there's strong selection against the non-sulfitic fish in the sulfitic environment. We have an F1 there. And you see that there are low levels of migration downstream into the non-sulfitic environment. Although these, these individuals were not sampled downstream, but we see that. Now we've done since then some um, more purposeful targeted recapture of 200 individuals in their sulfitic and non-sulfitic um, kind of reference panel of genes. This was over 200 genes, half, about half of which were related to sulfide and oxidative phosphorylation, and the other half are reference genes that are matched for being mitochondrially located, et cetera. And so here's our population tree from those data, and each tip is one of the individuals. And when we make a tree of sulfide-related genes, we, we confirm what we had found in our little single genome study, whereas all individuals that um, we have clustered together and seem to have a single origin for all of the sulfide-related trees. And when we look at a haplotype network for SQR, again, supporting a single origin. Okay, so we see this shared origin with closely related populations. So what happens when we look at more divergent lineages? And we had some really fun conversations today about this. All right, so we're going to take a step back to zoom out. There are multiple different species that live in one of the springs. So this kind of hopefully allows us to control for the environment because they all three of these different species live in one spring. And um, this is where they're distributed along the tree. So if you can't see the tiny yellow ticks, just pay attention to where the fish are and that's where they are. So they're, they're spread ag across this tree. They're relatively divergent. They're quite divergent in terms of of these lineages, and we see that they have convergent increases in the sulfitic ecotypes to hydrogen sulfides. This is the plot that I showed you before. It's just drawn for one of the populations 
where you have hydrogen sulfide increasing on the top plot and survival on the bottom plot with the lines corresponding to the non-sulfitic and sulfitic ecotype. We can do this for the other species and we see the same pattern, albeit with you know, diff slight differences in the difference between the curves, but the sulfitic perform better in the, non in the sulfitic environment as sulfide increases. There are also similar patterns of morphological divergence. So this we're looking at habitat divergence vector scores for males and females, or sorry, for sulfitic and non-sulfitic, not males and females, excuse me, sulfitic and non-sulfitic individuals. And you see these kind of vector scores being convergent across the sulfitic lineages. We look at variation. We see strong reductions in gene flow despite small spatial scales. Remember, they're all in the same springs. We're sampling the same locations, approximately the same locations for the sulfitic and non-sulfitic here. There are low levels of gene flow, but um, pretty small. So we scan the genome. Like, great, we're going to find the shared outliers. You know where this is going, right? There aren't any. There are totally unique patterns of genomic divergence depending on which population pair you're looking at. So when we step away from the population level, we see that in terms of these different species that are quite divergent, they have very unique patterns of divergence across the genome. And um, this is really like quite frustrating to see at first because we were thinking like, it's going to be shared, it's going to be SQR, this is so exciting. And we made this plot and we're like, no, no, this must be wrong. We're going to do a different plot. We're going to do a different scan no matter which way. We uh, look at the data, we really find very little sharing. So we said, okay, well, let's, let's look at gene expression. Gene expression is exciting. We like gene expression. We've seen lots of shared gene expression across our different populations. What happens? And we do see that shifts in gene expression are predictable. So these are three of the key genes involved in sulfide detoxification. And we see that in all of the sulfitic lineages, we see increases, shifts towards increased expression of those genes. That was, that was exciting. And so we then said, all right, what happens when we zoom this out to our much larger set of, of, of species? And here they are, just so you get a sense of how this larger set of species falls across the phylogeny. And keep in mind now we're sampling wild individuals from this whole range, almost the whole range. We didn't sample every single species for collection reasons. Um, we can then ask about hydrogen sulfide detoxifying genes in this larger context and ask whether or not they see we see consistent shifts in gene expression. And we indeed we do. We see higher levels of hydrogen sulfide uh, related genes in uh, the hydrogen sulfide adapted lineages. And so once we get away from the genome level, to the gene expression, we see a lot of sharing in terms of gene expression differences, regardless of the uh, phylogenetic divergence of the species or of the pair for that matter. Now, these are wild caught individuals. So I had some interesting conversations about today specifically about, you know, the role of plasticity in driving this versus evolved changes. And we know for for some of these populations, there are evolved changes, but we haven't done that experiment on all of the different populations. So it's really interesting to think about the different roles of evolved versus plastic changes, especially when you have really strong stressors. Okay, so we see convergent shifts in expression in all the sulfide fishes, and we know that detoxification and resistance are extremely important mechanisms for hydrogen sulfide survival, right? We found that there are multiple, but a limited number of ways to adapt to hydrogen sulfide. And, you know, I hope that this is giving you a flavor for how we think about replicated environments as giving us a way to look at and illuminating some of these evolutionary processes. Of course, you know, when we return to this picture of going from genetic variation to fitness, what we really need to start thinking about, and we're trying to do in a variety of ways, is also the environment, right? And how directly and indirectly biotic and abiotic stressors that are maybe related to our primary stressor, in this case, here's you know, our physiochemical stressor, hydrogen sulfide, are gonna affect each of these levels in potentially really different ways and directly or indirectly. So there's so much to be learned. And you know, today's conversations have been so exciting for me to think about different ways to think about my own work.
and talk about your work. So with that, I want to acknowledge the people that have contributed to all of these different projects. And I want to point out that currently I'm in Barcelona on a Fulbright España. And so for those of you that are thinking about going somewhere else, it's, I, I feel like I'm doing an advertisement for Fulbright now, but it's amazing for me. And so, you know, there are Fulbright opportunities for individuals to come to the US and to go to other places. So with that, I will open it for questions. <laughs>